Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another beautiful episode of the Just Jazz Cafe, man. It's my honor and pleasure to always be able to talk to some of the most special people in the music. You know, it's it, what you hear on the radio and what you hear in your CDs. It's, it's much more depth to it than that. And today we get a chance to talk to uh, two beautiful people. I mean, it's... La Voz de un Piano and La Voz de un Bajo, the two that I love so much, man. Mr. Fabian Almazan and Mr. Lynn and Miss Linda. Nate. <laughs> How are you guys? We're good. We're good. Oh, good. Yeah, thank you for having us on. So much clarity coming all the way from across the pond, Perth. Here I am ending my day and you're beginning your day. Uh, but it's all this synchronous love and music together for sure. Yeah, 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 it's bright and early here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, so many great things to talk about, you know. First of all, I'm just so enamored with all the music that you guys put out, and your label is fantastic. I want to talk about uh, Biophilia Records, man, and uh, your initial, what did you have inside of yourself to say, hey, this is something that needs to be done? And I mean, it's way more than just a record label, but I'll let you explain. Sure. Um, well, the impetus for it, I think, probably happened on the tour with Terrence where I met you in, in L.A. Uh, this would have been in maybe 2009 or so. Mm. Um, yeah, I just, I've always cared about the environment. And I remember on that tour, I had just read a book uh, called Biophilia by E.O. Wilson. He's an etymologist, uh, and it speaks about the theory that human beings are innately attracted to living things, which explains why we pay insane amounts of money to live near Central Park. Yeah, uh, things like that. So on that tour with Terrence, uh, we went through Seattle, uh, Portland, L.A. San Francisco, all throughout the West Coast. And I went through a couple of the zoos um, there on the West Coast, one of which was the C Seattle Zoo. Mm -hmm. And Herbie Hancock happened to be playing a concert at the zoo. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember Le Leonel was there playing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, even the animals were enamored. Everybody was listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was one of those moments where it kind of clicked uh, that these two worlds could come together because the, the Seattle Zoo is, is world renowned for its conservation efforts. That, that was what I was kind of uh, mostly uh, focused on when I visited the zoo separately from, from Herbie Hancock. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, that was the moment where things sort of clicked and then it took about a, a decade after that to really get everything uh, rolling to, to what it is today. Well, it's, it's an interesting experience. I would love to see how animals were responding to Herbie and Lionel <laughs> and the cats playing, you know? Did yeah. the orangutan sit up and go, ooh! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, surprisingly quiet. Whenever I remember Herbie played an intro, and yeah, I'm not kidding when I say even the animals were quiet, they were listening. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you've done some wonderful things uh, with biophilia in terms of, you know, it's, it's about being in touch with the environment. And yes, we like to be around green. We like to be around water. And those are, those are the different stories of our life. And I think you guys tell it really well uh, in a lot of the music that you compose. And, you know, you have to tell me why on earth strings are so beautiful, man, with with, with strings and nature and water, I mean, it all seems to come together really wonderfully. Well, I think both uh, Mehan and I, uh, Lin Linda Mehan, oh, uh, we, we, yeah, Mehan, Linda, same thing. <laughs> um, yeah, we both have been uh, interested in that since we met back at uh, Manhattan School of Music a uh, hundred years ago. <laughs> not quite um, I mean we I guess we can both uh, speak to this but for me for me uh, I just feel like the string quartet and the orchestra in general if I could write for orchestra that's what I would do not that I don't have a love for string quartet but for me the ultimate goal has always been uh, orchestral music it's just able to tap into 
another sort of region of that emotional spectrum that we're, we're trying to convey as artists. Uh, for, for me, playing in a trio or playing with, with a horns uh, is one thing. And then with strings, I feel like it's, it's just a different color mm. that uh, I think I benefit from as a human being uh, in just being able to, to resonate emotionally with. Uh, that, that, that's all it is, really. I appreciate all timbres, uh, but, but that one in particular just seems to resonate with me. You? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Um, the, the different timbres, it's good to have those options. And, um, you know, I think we're very lucky to work with musicians who are, are very adept at many different genres and who are great improvisers as well and who can really sit within a, a group in, um, in the setting like, like the groups that we have, but then also be able to do um, more traditional string quartet stuff, you know, they're, they're quite versatile and um, um, there have been string musicians, I think, who've kind of paved the way for yeah. that, um, you know, um, with, within the improvised scene and, and slowly more and more people are doing it and being quite versatile and we're very lucky to be able to access that and have that as another color in our music. Yeah, particularly I think uh, Tomoko Omira and, and uh, Sarah Caswell, I feel with both of our ensembles, the two of them are really trying to uh, pave the way for improvised string music. Yeah. At least in this generation, because there have been people in previous generations. Yeah, and albums that have influenced us yeah. too, you know, yeah. with, with strings and jazz musicians writing for strings, yeah. Andrew Hill for strings, James oh. Budd Elmer for strings, and, and people who have just done um, great work um, incorporating that. Yeah. yeah. Well, there has been a lot of great, great work throughout history and um but you know it's 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 now and it takes you know this this youth and beauty that you have to cultivate the sound so that you know folks don't think that that is the sound of the past that is the sound of now and um you know we're living in some really strange times and when you have sound and music and culture and all these things you know coming together man i, I know how um you even give some of your music away just to help help heal people through uh, some of these challenging times um yeah. and we just produced a uh a, a concert we're going to do a series of concerts called jazz musicians unite against racism and basically if, I mean, if you ask me, and I think a lot of others too, jazz musicians, there's no, I mean, as I said, we all come together. There's, there's not much racism going on in this language that we speak. It's all about coming together and, and, and learning uh, our different cultural experiences and sounds and strings and, you know, harmonies and putting them together to put something beautiful on this earth, you know. So yeah. uh, the way you put your your music together and the way that you guys combine, I, I think is kind of very similar there, but let's, let's talk about your music and, and your music, of course, and what it does for these times. We're in a pandemic and of course there's, you know, crazy racism going on that's always been going on, but now has a spotlight on it. What can the music do to help, help heal some of these people and those things that are afflicted by it? Well, it's a sad and unfortunate reality, as you described. Um, and in my mind, I, I grew up. I grew up in Cuba, where, of course, there is still uh, racism, but not not the type of division I would say that there is in the United States. Mm. the The culture as a whole in Cuba, as I experienced it, is such that you are a Cuban first, and then we might see each other's uh, skin color differences. But there, there is no such thing as white people talk this way, black people talk this way. Uh, there's white culture, black culture. It's all Cuban culture. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it was very foreign when we moved to Florida to experience that sort of stark difference I mean, we could talk about this for hours. Um, I know. Uh, for, for years, we could talk about it. Um, but I've, 
I've always felt that it's important to both acknowledge our differences and our human humanity, uh, to champion our cultural distinctions yeah. as well as our, our similarities. And I, I feel that a, a, there was a, a trip that I took to South Africa that had a, a very big impact on me. Um, I went to the to the apartheid museum there. And oh, I was. A... I, I knew about. It. So, yeah, it's a very powerful museum. To me, it's it's the most effective museum I've ever attended. It really had a profound. Uh, I, I had a profound reaction to it. Sure. Um, and I learned more about Nelson Mandela at that point and his whole philosophy of bringing people together uh, again really resonated with me. I, I think it's it's in the same way that when we have a house, uh, just gravity is going to try to you know, bring it down. There's going to be maintenance that needs to happen. Uh, that in of itself is not bad. It's just the nature of the house. Uh, and I think it's the same thing with the question of racism. Uh, I hope that people are innately good. <laughs> and because of that, there are influences that come about from, from less good people that threaten the stability of that house, that structure, with, which is us. And it's our responsibility uh, to make sure that the structure is sound. So we have to continue to talk to each other how we are right now about what our cultural distinctions are what has led to us being who we are now, our families, that sort of thing. Uh, just so that, yeah, we have to keep each other in check. No matter how, uh, how enlightened we think we are, we have to continue to ask ourselves questions. We have to continue to communicate with each other. N not, not to assume things about each other, but just to listen to each other. So I, I think music in of itself uh, has played a huge role in every single social movement that has ever happened. Um, and I think it's very difficult to try to, um, uh, what's the word, to predict what that music will sound like. But, but it comes from, from a person that is open enough to, and courageous enough to present to the world music that hasn't been heard before. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it takes courage to, to translate that and, and have that voice be a statement at that particular time in, in life. And, you know, yeah. as you look back through all the music that was made during these times, and you look at now everyone that's coming forward uh, with all of this new music and, and spoken word with a, with a beautiful backdrop, it's just... It's a great juxtaposition on how these messages, because I think words and harmony, you know, and these mantras, that's what sinks in, you know? And yeah. uh, as you say, so hopefully some of these people will, will get the message. Um, I wanted to talk, you know, a little bit about, you know, Terrence. I know Terrence recognized, you know, the talent uh, quite a long time ago, man. And it was, it was wonderful meeting you back then. And Linda, we met uh, a little later on. But, um, you know, Terrence is, is doing more than uh, playing music now too. He's scoring films, he's been doing all these things with Terrence and I know you, you both have some interest in that as well. And your music is like a perfect backdrop for it. Yeah, well, um, you know, it's funny because Linda and I, on one occasion, we actually got to play together. Uh, has it been more? No, twice, right? Yeah, twice we got to play the, the music of Spike Lee. Oh. Uh, it, and Terrence's band, and that was really nice as well. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, Sp Spike is doing great, great work. Also, uh, Casey Lemons, she just made that movie uh, Harriet that, oh. that Terrence uh, scored as well. Yeah, yeah, and I, I yeah, I uh, for everybody watching, I highly recommend that you uh, go watch Harriet. It's a, it's about Harriet Tubman, and I mean, the subject matter obviously is, is about uh, the Underground Railroad, but the way that the film is shot, it's just really beautiful. There's some uh, nocturnal shots in there and it's just the storytelling is beautiful. And, and Terrence enhanced that certainly yeah. with his score. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've been extremely 
uh, inspired to to learn more about just the sound that that can be created in a very broad term because yeah. if there's one thing that that Terence does is not necessarily think of himself as just a jazz musician sure he he approaches the art, art form is just that it's sound and what what can we do with sound to to benefit humanity in a very broad term uh, oh, yeah. He, um, yeah, I, I feel very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah, he pays attention. You know, I, I had a, I interviewed him a, a while back and I asked him, I'm like, okay, so I'm watching the film and I'm like, oh man, Terrence Blanchard is doing the music. Great. Then I watched the movie and then at the end I see Terrence Blanchard did the music. I'm like, oh, that's right. I'm like, he, he did it, but he took the Terrence out, you know, and I asked like, oh man, you just got to, you know, you just got to give your visuals what the music you know what it asked for with the music yeah sort of the story yeah. yeah and you have some inspirations in terms of scoring film too right or have you have you done a project i mean sorry are you, are you speaking to linda or me oh both of you um, yeah i mean I, i've scored uh both linda and i have done the sundance film composers lab uh which we both absolutely loved mm. um, and we've both done some uh short shorts work you worked on the feature length, like a full length film as well. No? Oh, I thought you had, sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, we've done uh, short films. My, I mean, I've, I've stated many times that my ultimate dream is to write music for uh, nature documentaries. That's always been <laughs> my, my dream. Well, tell me yeah. about Songs of the Forgotten. I know that you start off with these natural sounds of birds and it's really captivating when you you listen to it and you get inside the music. I see a great visual of that. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, um, I went back to Cuba for the first time in, in 23 years. Uh, hey, which you're 23 was, years old, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in dog ears. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I went back uh, for the first time I was very fortunate that my beautiful wife, who wasn't my wife at the time, we hadn't gotten married yet, uh, was able to come with me. But her trip to Cuba had to be cut short because she had this little uh, recording session with a guy named Pat Metheny. So uh, she had, to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was extremely emotional for me to go back, and it meant the world to me that that Linda could be there. And yeah, so I. I I was the recipient of a grant. Uh, it was the Jerome Fund. Thank you to the Jerome Fund, right. which allowed me to to purchase uh, equipment to record out in the field. So I made field recordings in the western edge of Cuba and the island, and just set out to meet biologists and field uh, biologists that served as guides for me to find specific endemic Cuban birds. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, yeah, I went out there and I recorded uh, different uh, forests and jungles and things like that. And then really tried to incorporate the folkloric music from those regions into the music that I recorded. And I happened to meet through the biologist, the old town uh, musician in a, play called, in a place called Las Terrazas. Uh, who, this guy, it was like <laughs> Quixote and Pancho. <laughs> That they were just sitting on the side of the road with a guitar singing. Uh, and the biologist said, oh, that's the guy. So we just got out of the car. And that's how that happened. We just struck up a conversation. And he, he told me to, to challenge him to a decima, which is when you, when you say the last line of a 10 uh, line poem. And then on the spot, the poet, as they call themselves, have to improvise a 10 line. It's, almost, it's a lot like hip hop when, when you're battling with yeah. someone. It's called, yeah. Yeah, it's called a controversia, which, controversia, which means controversy. And that's the style of that, uh, where you have to challenge the person. To, and he did it on the spot, and that's what ended up on the, on the album. Oh, man, I love that. I love yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Linda, there's so many powerful uh, women in jazz and um, you know and I, I look at you as one of those I look at you with this quiet power you know 
you may you say so much with your bass, you know, maybe not so much vocally, but I, I hear all of this uh, music and the sound and this empathy coming from you. So tell me about, you know, your albums, Initial Here and Aventurine and some of the thoughts and philosophies behind putting that music together. Um, yeah, um, so my latest album is Adventuring. Um, it, it features um, a, a small choir from, from here in Australia um, called Invenio, directed by Jan Slater, um, and also has um, uh, myself, um, Greg Ward on alto sax, Matt Mitchell on piano, Chess Smith on drums, and then the string quartet, um, Sarah Caswell, Fang Chen Hui, Benny Von Goodsight, and uh, Jeremy Harmon. Um, and uh, yeah, that's been my latest work so far. Um, it's um, the title of Venturine is, is a stone, a type of quartz, which resembles creativity and, um, and evolution. So um, the album itself has kind of been a slow burn over the years. Um, I think, you know, juggling, touring and um, being a band leader and amongst other things, um, it's nice to have works that you're working on along the way. Um, even if, you know, there was a point where I was like, well, I, I don't know if any of this stuff will ever get released, but it was just kind of chipping away at this project. And um, eventually, yeah, it came out last year and um, we've been playing a bit of that music around and yeah. Um, so that's, that's the latest uh, project so far. Um, and um, the album before that is Walk Against Wind, uh, which is, um, the title comes from Marcel Marceau, who's kind of um, the famous mime artist about walking against the wind. And um, I guess, you know, the main themes in that album is about kind of um, not always maybe choosing the easiest path, but the one that kind of pulls you that you kind of need to go in many ways, you know, and um, Myself, myself, I thought was a pretty amazing person. He influenced all sorts of people like Michael Jackson and, and um, many artists. Uh, but it was also, um, it's quite interesting the way he used his, his talent to, to help people. Um, during World War II, he helped to um, get young children, young Jewish children across the border um, in, in Europe into safety um, uh, by kind of using his, his skills as a mime and with kids and keeping them quiet and playing games with them <clears throat> so that they could escape, you know, and um, he also was quite a talented um, painter. And so he would falsify their documents and make them look real and, and give them safe passage. So he was someone that was kind of pretty inspiring. And um, whenever I teach or teach- You're somebody that's pretty inspiring. <laughs> sorry. When, I, I've, always, I've always been inspired by Linda, even before we were married. Sorry, continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, whenever I teach or, or talk to students about looking beyond um, the notes, you know, I think sometimes with education, uh, although it's, it's awesome and, and we, should, we should embrace it, um, but when we're teaching the arts sometimes um, and we get into theory and fundamentals, which is definitely important and we need to know, but some of the bigger picture of ex expression and what we want to do with that music, um, sometimes when we get caught up in all that, the theory and the nuts and bolts of things, we may forget some of um, these intentions, you know. So um, I like to kind of talk about him and, and, and other people who've, who've really made a difference with their art and, and what they've, they've really expressed to the world. Well, I mean, that's, that's history. You just actually taught me a little bit of it because I did not know that about Marcel Marceau. But when you, when you put the music together and you put your stories together, it always, it, it always ends up sinking in, especially, I don't know what grades you teach or whatever, but especially with children, they're the ones that can receive these vibrations and these messages. And then they keep them for their entire lives, whether they know they have them or not. And at some particular point, they're gonna re reach inside and remember that. And I think it's the music along with the history that kind of sears that uh, inside your soul, you know? And so that's, that's fantastic. Well, again, about um, your label, you have a beautiful record label and you had a wonderful festival uh, not long ago, which 
I really wanted to check out and be a part of and, 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 and watch everyone. But I, I'm not the guy that's uh, come home, sit down at six o'clock and, and turn your computer on. And I'm, I'm on the run trying to do all these jazz things here in Los Angeles. Yeah, thank you for all the work that you do, by the way. Oh, yeah. on, man. You, yeah. you guys, you, you guys are the ones that actually make me. I could not even exist without, you know, you and your music. So I'm always willing to do whatever I can to support it. It's a, uh, it's a huge thing. But another thing that I want to talk about is learning about all of these artists that are on your album and how did they come to you? Did you come to them? And what is the synchronicity? that makes them family of biophilia records uh well uh me <laughs> uh it's it's a uh, it's a peculiar uh seat to be in i never thought i'd be the person that says you may enter and you <laughs> i wish i wish i could say you may enter to every single person that reaches out to me but unfortunately the reality is that we are an independent label and I, I, I just, I can't afford to say yes to everyone. Yeah. Uh, I've heard some incredible music that has been, uh, that I've been approached with that I, you know, for, for whatever reason, I just, I can't manage to have that artist on the label at that time. Mm. Uh, but it, it's uh, first and for foremost, the music to me has to be compelling. It doesn't even have to be good. <laughs> I. It just has to be compelling. I, I, I feel very strongly that uh, everybody is different. Everybody uh, resonates with different types of music. There is no such thing as good or bad music. It's just whatever music uh, feeds your soul. Mm -hmm. so I, I try to keep that in mind whenever I, I'm considering which album is going to be part of Biophilia Records. Yeah. Just that, that, it, that it's genuine and that it's honest. Uh, and that in of itself is subjective because I'm the one <laughs> determining that. Well, you can uh, feel, feel that honesty and sincerity coming through the music most of the time, and you can feel it. And, you know, it's it's a show. You know? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And so that that's the the number one uh, priority for me to be able to select genuine, honest, uh, imaginative music. Beyond that, typically the artists that approach me. Uh, also have an interest in, in contributing positively to climate change and environmental causes and a variety of other so social injustices as well. And that's it. That's pretty much it. That, that's how uh, they end up on the label. I, it's not that complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the environment is obviously um, really, really important to you. I think I yeah. even saw one time you guys were out cleaning up a park or picking up some trash. You got to have the whole, I don't know if it was a whole label out there. Don't let me make, make things up. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I just, it, it shows that you care about your environment. You care about your planet and, you know, you, you care about your world. And that's, that's only <laughs> one level. Then you, then you show that with the music, you know, and, and, and the music that you both write, you know, it's, it's in there too. You can tell that you're you're caring about people. You're caring about what they receive on that end. You're not writing it for them. You're writing it for the true nature of the sound. But mm -hmm. it's all encompassing, and you can, it's a it's a beautiful healing sound. You know, I as a <clears throat> jazz DJ, I don't really sit and listen to people's albums. I um, I go through the albums. Ooh, I want that because this is the color that I need right now to either go with this or change direction with this. So, you know, I tell my stories that way through uh, a bunch of different artists. But for your albums, it's like you need to, you need to just sit back and, and listen to, to all these tracks. <laughs> it's like, it's like a, a story, you know. I, I've been walking a lot lately. You know, that's pretty much all I can do in the pandemic is give myself some fresh air, you know, since we can't do much else. Mm -hmm. But uh, I walk for miles, you know, and I, I kind of listen back to a lot of my shows to see how they're constructed. But an album mm -hmm. like, like you guys create, it's like, that's a story that's continuous that I can continuously use as I'm walking through, you know, the park, as I'm walking on my miles. It really allows me to feel the music 
and keep thinking at the same time. So I think that's really important. You guys really do it well, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> one, one thing that I, that I do want to add that it's kind of, you're going to be the first one to share it with the world because we haven't said it anywhere. Um, I, I, I really, as a label, do want to be proactive about uh, environmental justice and, and climate change and the arts and everything. So we, we are launching uh, this week uh, a series. We're, we're commissioning writers Whoa. to write about uh, the, the name of the commissioning series is, is called Impacts. And it's just impacts on music, impacts on the environment, on different uh, communities. And the first writer that we have uh, is from Kenya. And one, the largest a garbage dump in, the, in, in Africa is located uh, right in Nairobi. And he's writing about the environmental injustice that his people have experienced for, for 50, uh, 50 years now. Uh, and so we're going to make it so that the readers can help out uh, we're going to have petitions and these things so that we can have an impact, <laughs> a positive impact on the world. Uh, th that'll be coming out as a newsletter and our social media outlets. So it's very much uh, in line with the label, the, sure. the, the feel of the label, but it's not necessarily even music related. It's just how we can help each other. <laughs> right, right. Well, that, that goes more along with your, your, your lovely giving hearts, man. And, and it just shows that you all care about your planet so much, man. And, and you actually make everyone else stop and look at you. And then, you know, I have to look back at myself. I just walk past that piece of trash. <laughs> Let me go pick that up, you know? <laughs> you know, it's, 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 a, it's a consciousness. I mean, I'm, it's not guilt. Don't get me wrong. But it's, you know, I, I look at you guys, I look at the way that you're living and what you care about. And then I, I have to question myself. I'm like, am I doing, am I, am I taking a look at that? You know, I, I saw um, <clears throat> one time in, in San Francisco at the Yerba Buena Center. Um, I, I went up there to visit a friend and we went to go see Yusuf Latif. Mm. And, um, you know, he was talking about, you know, the trees and and the leaves and them moving and that they're saying hello to you. Like, did you even see that? You know, there's so many natural things that go on on our planet that one people take for granted and two, you know, their lives are so mixed up and crazy that they don't have a chance to live a life. You know, it's like life is living them. You know, and it's always nice to stop sit back, take a look, take in some fresh air, take in some nature, um, yeah. look at what's going on around you and how what you're doing and what other people are doing are affecting each other and, you know, yeah. make a change. And you're, you're doing that through the music and through other avenues as well, man. So that's... Yeah, and that's, that, that's, that's why I, I want to reach, reach out as an artist to to scientists and politicians and things like that, because what you just described to me is heartbreaking. The fact that th there is a large percentage of the population throughout the world that because their, their lives are so difficult, they can't enjoy such a simple thing as, as the sway of a tree branch or mm -hmm. anything like that. And that stems from uh, greed <laughs> in the world and a lack of uh, appreciation for the arts. Mm. And, and that is, I don't want to get too political on your show. I know we're talking get it, about get it. Get it. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that's the responsibility of government to provide that room for people to enjoy their lives and not have to live every day just fearful of how am I going to feed my kids? How, how am I just going to survive? Um, it's, 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 I mean, coming from somebody that grew up in a communist dictatorship, by no means am I condoning that sort of uh, governmental approach, but there has to be safety nets. There, there's a reason that we are all bound together by a nation and it's so that we take care of each other. Um, and there is zero leadership uh, stemming from the top uh, in the United States right now. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, it's, it's infuriating because I come from a place where as soon as you take your finger off the pulse and you should let it go on autopilot, these things start to happen. We have to be engaged. We have to vote. For everybody that, that uh, loved Obama, listen to Obama. He's, he's, he's giving us his insight into what he thinks uh, the best path to take is. Um, it's so frustrating to me the people saying, I won't vote for Biden because, okay, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. I'm, I'm listening. We're listening to you, and this is your platform. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yes, the man is not perfect. The man is flawed. But look at the other quote unquote man. <laughs> you know, the, we have to, even democracy is just the best option we have. Uh, capitalism is the best option we have. We have to, we have to be realistic about the situation and, and not just want to hear the sound of our own voice and think that because we have the ability to speak that it, that is justified or mm -hmm. it, a lot of people are saying things that don't have value, <laughs> you know. We really listen to science yeah. and, um, and yeah. rationality. <laughs> yeah sorry i'm just no 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 worries man each one of us has has a heart and that heart that heart is supposed to be full of love man and and that's supposed to be emanating out uh -huh. all of us i mean that's how artists and that's how you know of course we think um and then there's then there's money you know we all need that too but it doesn't mean that you know one percent needs to keep all of it it's 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 a world for all of us for sure you know um so the pandemic in Perth, I mean, I think you guys were in Harlem and now you're in Australia, you know, we're many, many hours different here. We both got the same kind of light going on, which is great. Um, <laughs> but tell me about some of the differences in terms of uh, stress level, in terms of being able to have peace to create um, more music at this time and, and your connection with your musicians and family and, and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a very interesting um, few months, for sure. That's one way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> and just along the lines of um, leadership and, you know, listening to science, listening to experts who are trained in the field, um, in the health field, and, um, and how to deal with this pandemic, um, you know, Perth is a very different place. It's one of the most isolated major cities in the world. And I know there's there's a difference in population here compared to where we just came from in Harlem and in New York and the US in general. But there are zero COVID cases in this state. Mm. Zero and active community. When we say the state, that's like saying California. That's how big uh, the this, this state is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, so, and they've been very strict with quarantine laws. When we uh, arrived here, we had to quarantine in the hotel. Um, and it, um, that was for two weeks. We had a security guard outside our hotel room door. 24 or so. Yeah, and it's, I think it's like a $50,000 fine if you oh, what? try and escape yeah. or, uh, yeah, yeah, leaving, yeah. Or, uh, and possible jail time if you breach the quarantine laws. So they're very strict. Um, um, but at the same time, you know, at, at that time when we arrived, the government was was funding all of this. So as soon as you came in, they would take, they would funnel you off to a hotel, and you stayed there for two weeks. They would test you, and um, then when you're free with COVID, if you're COVID free, you can leave. Um, and we were just very lucky too because there were 20 people on our flight who tested positive. Oh. Um, so they had to stay quarantined in the hotel. So, um, yeah, they're being very diligent here and they're very, being very tough on these laws, but at the same time, that enables the community um, to, to still kind of go on. I mean, they had a brief lockdown, but at the moment, venues are open and I think they'll be at 100% coming up. Um, festivals are, are um, starting up soon. 100% capacity. 100% capacity. Um, and um, yeah, the, there'll be the Perth Jazz Festival coming up in November. Um, and, um, yeah, we were able to do a recording, um, last week, um, as part of this, this award ceremony called the Arts Music Award, Australian Arts Music Award. And, um, yeah, we were able to record, um, for the most part, people aren't wearing masks, but they're being careful. 
you know. Um, Chil children can play with each other. It's, yeah, uh, because I, there literally I mean, are zero cases here. Children are playing. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it's very much an alternate reality. Oh, sorry. <laughs> A bit different than California, where we're like five million people with with COVID, you know. Um, and you know, I uh, we've gone to the beach, and I've watched, you know, from a, from afar. We've got our mask on, but there are a lot of people who feel like, hey, man, this is this is ours, and we can do this. And they're they're not following the rules, which is why we're still, you know, I had our Just Jazz series booked all the way through December. And you know, month by month, I'm like, sorry, sorry, they're just, yeah. all that work is just kind of, you know, going down the drain. But we'll, we'll build it back up and, uh, mm. when we all start traveling and we all can see each other again and play with each other again and hug each other again. And mm. I'd love to get you guys down to, to play the series. I mean, it's just, I want you. I want you. <laughs> We'd love to. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with me today and, and, and talking about the earth and the music. And, you know, I, I want to know what song, what's the first song that came out of the love union? I know you guys wrote one together. I want to know what it is. <laughs> well, that's for the next show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but a good deal. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from them. That's uh, Linda Mahan O and Mr. Fabian Almazan in Perth, Australia, but hanging with us right here in Los Angeles, California, and all around the world. We love all these creative people that we get a chance to talk to and get some insights into them, into the music, and, and, and the motivation behind uh, some of the creativity today that they do. Thank you guys so much and uh, look forward to really seeing you in person. And uh, when all this is over, man, big hugs for everybody. All right. Yeah, you too. Stay safe, everyone. All right. Take care. Bye. Good night. Bye.